volunteers and participants that make our worship service a blessing. Thank you for being part of our church. Would you bow your heads with me as I pray before I get into the message? Lord Jesus, I do agree with the other prayers that have been said, uh, seeking your message today and seeking your blessing. Lord, we just want to continue in this spirit of openness and acknowledge that you are here with us. Your angels are here with us. I pray that you'd remove distractions, that this would be a, a time of communing with you. We continue in a spirit of communing with you right now. So speak to us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, you know, the story of Christ and the story of Jesus is like an unending basket that we can reach into and continue to find blessings, just like the uh, baskets that were used in the feeding of the, the multitude that just continued to provide the fish and the loaves or, or the, the oil in the Old Testament that uh, Elisha had uh, told the woman to pour the oil and it just seemed like it would never stop flowing um, at the word of Elisha. The story of Jesus is something we're going to continue to evaluate and appreciate and study and, and learn from throughout all eternity. I don't care if I live for a thousand Christmases, I will never be unable to appreciate different elements of the coming of Christ. There is just such a wealth of dimensions to the story of Jesus, whether you're talking about His incarnation or His ministry or anything related to uh, the, the, the saving work of Jesus Christ on this planet. I do love Christmas time. I, I recognize and I, I noticed when Dean Mark uh, prayed and he said, no, we don't really know the time of your birth, and that's true. It's a tradition and, and it's uh, uh, nothing that is historically verifiable, but we do know that he was born. He was born. He did come to this planet in a dramatic, miraculous way and begins to unfold in his life the answer of God, the final answer of God to the problem of sin in our world. For this Sabbath and the next two Sabbaths, I want to focus on an element of Christ's life uh, that we don't get a lot of information on. We kind of go from his birth and we celebrate his birth and all the miracles and the wise men and the shepherds and, and, and the nativity and all that. We love that. Uh, but there's not a lot of Bible information. And then we get right to when he's baptized around the age of 30. And, uh, and we appreciate all that comes after that. But for this Sabbath and then following ones, I want to look a little bit into those more nuanced parts of the life of Christ con between his birth and his baptism. So for today, we're gonna, I'm going to share with you some, uh, some ideas and some uh, elements of Christ's life as he grew up. Next week, I want to talk about dad. I want to talk about Joseph and, and see what the Bible reveals to us through the life of Joseph and what his impact was on the Savior and his life. And then on December 24th, I don't know, if, are you going to come to church on Christmas Eve? All right, I heard a pretty good response there. So Christmas Eve, we will be having services as normal, and uh, I'm going to be talking about Mary and uh, looking at Mary in, in maybe a way you haven't thought of before. Same with Joseph and uh, the message today. So I, I hope it will be of benefit for us to look at these elements together. Growing up with Christ, what do you think it was like to have the Savior in the family growing up? And of course, now, again, I want to be careful here. There's limited biblical information on this. We have to be careful to not dramatize beyond what would be applicable to the revelation of Scripture. Uh, but Scripture does give us some, some fascinating insights and windows into what it may have been like growing up with Jesus Christ. So I do have a, a quiz this morning. And if I could have my volunteer microphone assistance so that the kids can be heard in the sanctuary. I see coming from the back, Toby is coming. Can I get one more volunteer, please? Jaden, now that you've been baptized, I can allow you to hold the microphone. <laughs> Two baptisms, all right. All right, question number one. Did Jesus have brothers and sisters? How many did he have if he had them? What, what do you think here? Zero, two. There's some options for you. I see Julian here, and I see a couple others. D. He said, you said D or E? D? Okay, Julian says six. We'll have a few other answers. Um, Andre? Two. 
All right, Andre is pretty convinced is two. A Abel, did you want to share something? I can't quite tell. Zero. All right, Abel says, I don't think he had any. I think I know this one. Okay, uh, let's do one more. I see some hands right here. Jaden, I think that's Eric. Two. All right, he says two. All right, I'm going to go ahead and, and give you the answer. Now, again, I'm talking about, you know, of course, we're all brothers and sisters and, you know, and the disciples and all that, but in his actual family structure, the Bible tells us he had at least six. You know, and this is something, if you haven't thought about it before, I mean, how often have you seen a depiction of young Jesus with brothers and sisters all over the place? It's not common. We typically envision the Savior as this only child, right? Uh, often with Mary, sometimes with Dad, with Joseph. But G the Bible says that he had at least six siblings. He was not an only child. He was not raised in an only child uh, home. What were his brother's names? You know, the Bible actually tells us his brother's names. What were his brother's names? Here's some options. Was it Peter, Andrew, Nathaniel, and Philip? James, Judas, Simon, and Joseph, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Moses, Aaron, Caleb, and Joshua. Did I see any hands? All right. You can come up here. Abel, go, or, yeah, Abel, go ahead. A. He says A. All right. Over here, Ketzia. B. Ketzia says B. And then we'll take Dylan. And then grab Eric here, too. Dylan. A. Dylan says, we got A and B competing. No, Eric. Well, I see Andre. Okay, the one that I'm pointing to. <laughs> Ezekiel's brother. A. Another A. All right, I'm going to have to give this one. I know you guys are ready to go, but we're going to keep the message going. Uh, you know, Peter and Andrew, they were brothers in the sense that they became friends and disciples. But the names of Jesus' brothers are actually James, Judas, Simon, and Joseph is probably a... Aramaic, Greekified version of Joseph, just like Judah becomes Judas or Joshua becomes Jesus or Jesus, Greek tended to want to add an S to the end of male names. Um, so Joseph is probably a form of Joseph. So he had at least four brothers, four brothers, and there's their names. And here they are in the Bible. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? And brother, here they are, this is from the Bible, Mark 6, 3, of James and Joseph, Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters. Notice the S at the end of sister. That means there were at least two because it's plural. And who knows, there could have been three, four, five. Okay? Jesus grew up in a typical Jewish large family for the day. Are not his sisters with us. So at least six. Number three, what rough town did Jesus and his brothers and sisters grow up in? Was it Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Jericho, or Nazareth? I want to give some people that haven't had a chance yet. Oh, come on over here to our academy suit. D. D, Nazareth. Let's get a couple others a chance to answer. I see Ryan back here. So many hands. Oh. Nazareth. What'd you say? Nazareth. Nazareth. Brian says Nazareth. Okay, one more. All right, Nico. A. All right. Everyone but Nico is right. <laughs> <laughs> so some of you knew this well. Uh, he, he is obviously born in Bethlehem. A lot of ministry takes place in other cities in Jerusalem. But he grows up in Nazareth, and the Bible reveals to us that Nazareth was not known as a place uh, of great uh, affluence or, or safety. You have this statement of Nathaniel saying, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Nazareth was kind of known as that, uh, that town on the other side of the railroad tracks where it was kind of rough. And we have places and, and, and cities like that in America, too. So now this also reveals to us something else about Jesus uh, growing up. He was poor. He was poor. And there's several Bible ways of understanding that Jesus was poor. One of them is that if you weren't poor, you wouldn't live in Nazareth. 
If you had any ability to raise your level, you would not stay in that circumstance. So but by the very fact that Joseph and Mary remain in Nazareth reveals that they were people of limited resources, limited opportunity. The other way that we know they were poor is that when Jesus was dedicated at eight years old in the temple, they offered, Mary and Joseph offered the offering of the poor. The normal offering would have been a lamb. When a baby was born, you would bring a lamb as a burnt offering and a purification offering to the temple. But Leviticus says, if you're unable to afford a lamb, the poor may bring two turtle doves or two pigeons. So when Jesus was dedicated, they offered, and the Bible says that they were a righteous family. They weren't cheating the Lord. They were doing the best that they could. They offered the offering of the poor. Sometimes people ask, what did they do with the gold, frankincense, and myrrh? Those were highly valuable things that the wise man brought them. Wise man brought them. Tech, usually historians and scholars will say that probably financed their trip to Egypt and, and gave them the sustenance they need to live for three months while Herod was trying to kill them. And then when they came back, probably very little was left over. Again, we, we can't say that for sure. But Jesus growing up in Nazareth illustrates that he also grew up in a poor family. What else do we know about Jesus? This is kind of an open open one for any of you young people. When you think about the child Jesus, are there any other things that you can think about him? This is just open if you can remember anything from your your Bible stories. All right, Nico. Um, When he was 12 years old, he went to the temple. Yes, the story of him going to the temple. Uh, Gloria, did you want to say something too? Same thing? Okay. So yeah, that's the the one major story that remember that reveals to us a little bit about what was going on in the life of a 12-year-old Jesus. Okay? All right, Andre will have the last one. Where are you, Jaden? Don't let me down here, man. He's coming around. Very well done. Okay, Andre, last comment here. What else do we know about Jesus' childhood? He was very smart. Oh, he was smart. Very good. That's right. Toby, Jaden, thank you so much. You can set the mics on the front pew. We'll probably be fine. Well, we do know that his father was a carpenter and that Jesus developed carpentry skills and was also known as a carpenter. Um, So he probably uh, took on the family trade. Any of you else have a dad who was a carpenter? My dad was a carpenter. (laughs) So a few of you out there grew up having a carpenter or or a tradesman, craftsman. Um, yes, as Andre said, he at the age of 12 revealed that he did have a very good wisdom and knowledge, profound wisdom and understanding. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, he lived in a, as an obedient child. Luke makes this clear when he tells the story of Jesus going to Jerusalem at the age of 12. Even though Jesus had gotten separated from his parents, you might say, well, he was clearly disobedient or at least negligent in being separated from his parents his parents. But again, we know that Jesus was doing the will of the Father, and it was just an accident and an opportunity for Mary and Joseph to be reminded of Jesus's true purpose when when that story unfolded there, uh, and he becomes separated from his parents. And Luke makes it clear at the end of that story, he says that Jesus continued in obedience to his parents, not rather, and so he therefore started to become obedient again. He had always been in obedience. It was just more of a misunderstanding, and God used that as an opportunity, again, to illustrate the purpose of Jesus uh, in that story of him getting separated from his parents. Luke also talks about how the grace of God was upon him. Now, this is important to, to just highlight because sometimes we use the word grace as leniency, or even as forgiveness, right? You get pulled over in that traffic stop, and you say to the cop, would you please be gracious? With, I could use some grace right now. What, you're asking for leniency, right? You don't do that? Or you guys never get pulled over, right? I understand. Do you, don't you ask? You, you, but you're asking for grace, right? You're asking for forgiveness. But grace also doesn't have to only mean that. When the Bible says the grace of God was upon him, it doesn't mean that the Lord needed to be lenient or forgiving because Jesus was not Um, uh, caught up in sin at any time. It means more that the blessings and pleasure of God was always on the the child Jesus. This is a, a collection of statements from Desire of Ages. In personality, Jesus, as a child, was known for a singular loveliness of disposition. That means your kind of default personality, 
right? You're, you're disposed to that. Just all things being equal. You know how some people have a resting face that's very pleasant? It's, it's like they're just constantly smiling. They're not trying to smile. Just their natural disposition is pleasant. Other people are kind of neutral, and then you have people who are kind of grumpy naturally. They don't mean to be grumpy, but that's their resting disposition. Jesus, as a child, even his, his demeanor, his personality was one of his loveliness. Patience that nothing could disturb. Grace of unselfish uh, courtesy. I want you to notice cheerfulness for a second. You know, when you read the stories of Jesus, how many smiles do you read about? How many times did Jesus laugh? Okay, the Bible doesn't talk about any of those things, and it leaves the impression. Now, the mission of Jesus was serious. It was sober. He was under constant stress, constant pressure, right? And even uh, Isaiah's prophecy of the suffering servant says that he would be a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And it gives the idea that Jesus was serious and sober all the time, that he never knew how to experience happiness, joy. And I remember in college, um, one of my... my uh, fellow students would say, but couldn't the Bible just say he smiled once? Couldn't the Bible just, I understand he had a serious mission, but what, couldn't the Bible just say he laughed once? And a buddy of mine uh, who, was, who was with me at the time, he says, you know, the Bible doesn't talk about his poopy diapers either, but it doesn't mean he didn't have them, right? Just because the Bible doesn't talk about it doesn't mean that Jesus did not understand what deep, pure gladness and happiness and joy was about. And I like that uh, the, the Spirit of Prophecy says that Jesus was known for a singular, and then all these attributes are shown, including cheerfulness. Jesus knows what it means to experience joy. Amen? Amen. It's not all just sober, serious business. Salvation is crazy serious, but it is also baptized in joy. The Bible says that we will be crowned with everlasting joy. Amen? Amen? Now, three of you thought that was a good thing. <laughs> We're a sober group here today, I can see. Um, you know, and I just uh, hesitate at this because uh, one of the illustrations that came to my mind is most of the movies that I have seen that are very apocalyptic in nature, you know, the asteroids coming or the aliens are about to wipe you out or disease is ravaging, and you have the scientists or the heroes, right, that are working on it, and they say, I don't have time for, I got to solve this, the asteroids coming, I don't have time for family, I don't have time for the, the party or the joy, and there's always, it's kind of a, a common motif, there's always that person in the background that'll say, well, what's the point of saving humanity if we have to sacrifice everything that's human in order to save it? Right? And that same sentiment I sometimes feel like with Jesus when people say, how come he's never happy? He was happy. He was deeply happy and content in his walk with the Lord. And as a child and as an adult, do not discount that just because the Bible doesn't talk about it doesn't mean he didn't experience it. He was a person who knew deep satisfaction, cheerfulness, and tact. Sympathy, tenderness, youthful modesty, and grace. We could talk about all of them, but that cheerfulness one is very important to me. From childhood, his one purpose in life was to bless, bless others. By the way, do you want to be happy? Make other people happy. Amen? If you want to be happy, don't focus on your own happiness. You help others. You bless others. And as a residual result, the way God has made our, our being and our personality, it blesses us. His one purpose in life was to bless others. And, of course, that brought him great and deep satisfaction. His willing hands, ever ready to serve them, he performed faithfully the duties of a son, brother, friend, and citizen. So, interesting. Growing up with Christ. I'd like to introduce you to my brother. His name's Jesus. He's 12 years old, but he's the Savior. Have you met Jesus? He's my brother, and he's the promised Messiah that we've been promised, you know, been told about. What was it like? It wasn't a mystery. It wasn't like he appeared out of nowhere in an unknown capacity and suddenly, not like David. David was not born as a king. He gets anointed as a king later, right? It, the, that identity develops over time. Jesus, from the time he came, was known to Joseph and Mary and to his siblings that he was the Messiah. Jesus, 
don't forget to turn off the light before you leave the house because we wouldn't want you to sin and leave the lights on. What was it like growing up with Christ? Now, again, I want to be careful. I don't mind a little sanctified, you know, guesstimation and, and, and things like that, but I, I do want to be careful. First thing to note, and I think it's very significant, maybe the most significant, is that the Bible clearly teaches that Jesus' birth created the appearance of an illegitimate family circumstance. Okay, you understand what I'm meaning? We don't, we don't live in this kind of culture anymore, but in those days, to not have a child through the natural prescribed mosaic manner of a married husband and wife was deeply significant. And the Bible makes it clear. When Joseph finds out that Mary was pregnant, you remember what it says in Matthew, it says that Joseph, being a righteous man, did not want to disgrace her, but sought to divorce her secretly. Okay? In Jewish law, he had the right to bring her before the priests and declare her as an adulteress and have her communally shame. That was right in the Mosaic law. He had the ability to do that. But his, in his sensitivity, in his acknowledgement, but he recognized that her pregnancy created a devastating dynamic for what his family would go through, hence thereafter. Having an illegitimate child. Now again, I know in your, in your contemplation you've thought of this before. You think they tried to tell people, no, no, this was, she wasn't fooling around. It was the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I, I assume they at least tried that with their most intimate family, but I, I don't think that they were going around. I, don't think they, I think they knew people wouldn't believe that. Would you believe that today? Uh, when I talk about Mary on the 24th, we'll get into a little bit of detail about that. Mary is probably younger now when she gets pregnant with Christ than most of us would be comfortable to admit. She was probably a teenager and again, I, I can explain more when the time comes. But if a young girl today that we knew and loved came into our, our context, you know, uh, pregnant and said, no, no, guys, I, I, I didn't do anything. The Lord came to me in a vision and this is a, you, you understand, we would be stretched to understand that as coming from God. So from the context of the community, Jesus grew up in a family that did not have honor. Okay? And this would be deeply significant in that time and context. When it came to family honor and community respect, the, the religious purity was paramount. Was absolute, from everything from how business was transacted to how they would interact in the synagogue to, to how they would interact with their neighbors. And by the way, this isn't that much different from how uh, you know, we deal with things today. Think about the business relations and marketplace dealings. Joseph is a carpenter. How does he make money? He makes money by making contracts for people to do labor. If you lived in Nazareth and you had three carpenters to choose from, you would choose those who had the most honor first. You would only go to the dishonorable family, you know, if you had no other recourse. And again, this isn't that much different than today. We choose businesses not necessarily based on their prices or logistics. Um, um, you know, right now, a lot of people are fleeing Twitter. Not because of, you know, this or that, but because they don't like Elon Musk, right? And so they say, we're not going to have anything to do with Twitter because we don't like the values of, of the owner of that company. I know people that will not shop at Home Depot, Hobby Lobby, or go to Chick-fil-A because they are overtly owned by Christians who try to have their Christian values expressed in their business. They won't go to them. In 2003, just from my own personal experience, when uh, the war in Iraq started um, as part of the war on terror... I don't know if you remember this. Do you remember that France opposed that? Do you remember that the French said, we are, de you know, we are opposed? I had family members that were, so, and this was a big national thing at the time. I mean, everyone, oh, the French won't support us. You know, we've been attacked, but they won't support us. I had friends and family members that said, because the French wouldn't support us, we won't go to, do you guys remember Mervyn's, the department store Mervyn's? Was there ever a Mervyn's in Arizona? Okay, well, it was like a department store, like, like uh, Macy's. Mervyn's was a French-owned company. So they said, I will not go to Mervyn's. I won't go to Target. It's an urban legend that Target is a French company because some people say Target. But they said that. They said, I won't go to Target, and I won't eat French fries. 
<laughs> they were protesting. They were saying, the values of these companies do not jive with me, so I will not support them. So you get what I'm saying here. Jesus grew up in a family that the community would have said, you do not have the honor of our business. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. Now, the Bible makes it clear that this was part of the dynamic of Jesus' childhood. When you think of Jesus' ministry later, okay, in this uh, thing of business relations and marketplace dealings, the very first person that Jesus would go to and invite to become the first proclaimer of his public ministry was a dishonorable woman who had to come to a well at the top of noon because she was not welcome there when the rest of the women were there. Now think about this. Jesus probably saw his own mother have to do the same thing because Mary, too, likely was not welcome in the same female communal circles because she had a child out of wedlock. I don't think it was just divine mercy and grace in the plan of God that Jesus would make a woman who was socially unacceptable the very first to be able to proclaim that the Messiah had come when probably his own mother experienced a very similar thing. Perhaps even Mary had to do the same thing. Maybe she had to go to the well in Nazareth at noon when all the other women weren't there because she was not a woman with honor. Do you understand how this influences our appreciation of who Jesus was? Uh, you know, he would have loved that woman had he grown up in a perfect real, uh, family. Don't get me wrong. Jesus would have loved to have honored and, 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 and include these people. But the reality of his own childhood definitely had to have influenced how he related with people thereafter. And I think it's just profound and wonderful that Jesus would go to that Samaritan woman and he could relate with her and say, now I know that you're in circumstances that are brutal and you've made some poor decisions, but I had a mother that experienced something like this. And I want you to tell people that the Messiah has come. Business relations, marketplace dealings, religious participation and ritual purity. This was a society obsessed with ritual purity. You can imagine that when they went to synagogue, and the Bible says that as his custom was, Jesus went to the synagogue. So he was faithful in his participation in the local synagogue in Nazareth. You can, you can guarantee that they didn't, were not seated in the place of honor. You can guarantee that they were not invited into the spiritual influence of the synagogue. That while they may have been there as a family that had not embraced an honorable lifestyle, they would have been at the edges. And again, this just influences our understanding. When Jesus, later on in his ministry, would go to synagogue, and when he would see people not appropriately treated, he knew what that was like. And I think particularly in the Gospel of Luke, when Jesus sees the man with the withered hand, right? Do you remember this story? He's in church, he's in the synagogue, and he sees the man. If you had a withered hand, it meant you were a sinner, God would never allow that to happen to a righteous person. You'd obviously failed somewhere in your life, and you are not a person to be respected or honored. Good thing you're in synagogue, but you're not going to be treated with the, the same level of dignity and respect. Jesus goes out of his way to call out this person. Bring him before the synagogue. Heal him in the faith. Heal him right in the eyes of all the priests. And he does it in a very uh, demonstrable, almost passive-aggressive way. It comes from a Jesus who knew what that was like. You with me? Because he himself had probably experienced it growing up in a family that did not have the social status of those around. And you can imagine how this may have also caused intra-family tension. Now, we know that he had a a family that supported him. But as we look further into the, the, the dynamics of his brothers and sisters, they did not really respect him. They didn't believe in him. They were actually offended at him, the Bible says. Now, you can imagine these siblings, and again, this is where we get a little bit dangerous into kind of uh, estimating things that we can't necessarily prove. But I can imagine, I have kids. Do, do siblings uh, ever get in arguments? even good kids, I can imagine that there was at least something like this where the sons at times said, Dad, you know, you could have gotten a better deal on this contract if our family didn't have dishonor and it's his fault. 
Dad, we wouldn't have to live in Nazareth. We could actually get out of here if we didn't have to live in poverty, but we can't get good marketplace dealings. We can't get good partnerships. We can't get good trade dealings. And you want to know why? It's because of him. Now, I, again, I can't prove that, but humanly looking at just the historical family dynamic, there clearly was at least some inter-family tension in the life of Jesus. He knows what it's like to suffer rivalry and to be rejected even by his brothers and sisters. Another element of Jesus' life that I just think helps us paint a picture of where he stood in the family is that the Bible makes it clear that Jesus was probably the youngest of the siblings. Now again, uh, up until a few up until recently I would say this was not a dramatic statement. The Catholic Church has taught forever <laughs> that Jesus was the youngest. Okay, they protect very carefully the integrity of the Virgin Mary. They don't even believe that when Jesus was born, it ended Mary's virginity. They believe that God pra- uh, miraculously protected the virginity of Mary and that she was a perpetual virgin. So the Catholic Church and the classic church, the Orthodox Church, has taught for over a thousand years that any siblings that Jesus could have had had to have come from Joseph from a previous marriage. So it's only more recent times the, the uh, Protestants have kind of uh, wondered if his siblings may have actually been from Mary and Joseph. And again, we don't, I cannot stand up here definitively and, and say, thus saith the Lord, the, the siblings were all older. But the, 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 the intent of the Scriptures seem, seem to tend to lean that way. Forgive me as I stumble over my words. His siblings tend to reveal an authority over him. They try to restrain him in Mark chapter 3. Their tone is very commanding. To him in Matthew 12, it says that they take offense at him in Mark 6 and that they don't believe in him in, Matthew, in John 7. Now, again, none of these are proof, but these would be unlikely attitudes if Jesus had been the oldest. You would not act that way to your elder brother in the Jewish world. You would not restrain, you would not command, and you would defer to him as the elder, even if he was doing things you may not agree with. You wouldn't take offense at him. Again, not proof positive, but the leanings of the text would suggest that he was not uh, the oldest. The Bible also uses this uh, way of segregating Jesus from the family by often referring to him solely as the son of Mary and then listing the siblings separate. Again, it says Jesus is son of Mary and there's these other siblings. Again, not proof positive, but it's just one of those little uh, little possibilities that the gospel writers are recognizing or in the dialogue that Jesus was of a separate uh, uh, family uh, than the siblings, that they would have been step brothers and sisters. Probably the most significant part of the Bible story that would lean this way is that when Jesus is on the cross, He does not commit His mother to James or to Judas or Joseph or Simon, His four brothers, he gives his mother's uh, care to the Apostle John. Again, it's not proof positive, but it's awfully uh, 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 suggestive that the other brothers were not sons of Mary. If they had been sons of Mary, clearly... And by the way, they did come to believe in Jesus later. So even the suggestion that, well, they weren't believers and he wanted her... Well, they did come to believe in him. James and Jude write the epistles of James and Jude. His brothers write those epistles. So they do become believers. They are there on Pentecost. His brothers were there at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon them. So the fact that Jesus gave Mary's care to John would also suggest that Jesus was not, um, the the other brothers were not uh, younger or um, from Mary. And then just um, prophetically, virtually every major Old Testament type of Christ is a younger sibling. Not all of them, but virtually every one of them, especially the major ones, going right back to the Garden of Eden. Abel was the younger brother killed because of the jealousy of Cain. Isaac was not his father's firstborn. Isaac was the secondborn. Jacob was the younger of the twins. Joseph is the younger of the brothers. Joseph, whose brothers uh, betray him and sell him into slavery and certain death. But Joseph is revived in their eyes and resurrected and becomes the source of salvation for the family of Jacob. Joseph is not the older. Neither is Levi and Judah. Levi and Judah are the younger brothers. Moses, Moses and David are probably the two biggest 
um, Old Testament types of Christ. And the Bible goes out of its way to emphasize and illustrate that they were both younger siblings. Moses is younger than Aaron and Miriam. David had, what, at least six older brothers, seven older brothers. Solomon is not the youngest. Samuel is not the oldest. Gideon's not the oldest. Most of the major Bible types of Christ in the Old Testament are younger siblings. There are exceptions. Samson probably most clearly was the oldest. Um, the other one that I thought of is Shem is listed first of the sons of Noah, and the lineage of Christ is traced through Shem. So again, it's not proof positive, but when you put all the pieces together, Jesus was probably the youngest. Now, why does this matter? Again, in the context of the family, the youngest is the one causing all the problems for the family. The intra-family tension comes from the youngest. Are any of you the youngest here? A couple of you the youngest? I see that. Yeah. What is it like for the youngest in the family? They're the favored one, right? They're the baby. Everyone protects the youngest. The youngest gets spoiled. The youngest doesn't have to do the chores. The youngest gets away with murder, right? Jesus was probably the youngest. And anytime you have a family, even a perfect circumstance, uh, family is hard. But when you start adding adoption or step brothers or half siblings, the variables increase. Doesn't mean it's impossible or can't be a blessing, but the challenges increase. And Jesus faced some of those similar challenges. Lastly, here, Jesus grew and developed with no special privileges or divine advantages. This is important. Uh, the Bible makes it clear, and Spirit of Prophecy goes into great deal, detail with that. It would not have solved the problem of sin if God had intervened in miraculous and dramatic ways to make Jesus a successful Savior. He learned the Scriptures. He learned submission. He learned kindness. He learned cheerfulness with the same tools and resources that every child today also has access to. Jesus experienced no special divine privileges or advantages. His wisdom and understanding came from diligent effort, study, and family commitment. Even at the age of 12, when he goes and talks with the, uh, the priests in the temple, it wasn't that God had just like crammed knowledge into his head and just said, you're the Savior, wake up, now you understand all the mysteries of salvation. Jesus was a diligent student, and even at the age of 12, teachers, he could overcome the wisdom of his teachers. <laughs> It just showed that, that how far we might say that the study of God's Word had drifted if even an average Bible, but diligent Bible student had a greater understanding of the truths of God than the elevated elite priesthood had. So Jesus was a good student. His perfect moral character was tested and tried with all the devil's power. From the time he was born, the devil knew who he was and was trying to destroy him, and that did not end during his childhood. It did not end. The devil continued to try to destroy him. He lived with the same innocent infirmities as everyone else. Have you ever wondered, did Jesus have acne? You know, did he ever, you know, these innocent, it's not, it's not a moral issue. You know, did he ever fall asleep? Did he, and again, we see from his time of ministry, Jesus got tired. He fell asleep in a boat, right? Jesus got hungry. He, uh, he, he got exasperated. Jesus sighed at times, right? You read that in the Bible. Jesus would sigh, exasperate. Jesus got angry. Jesus knows what it's like to feel pain. These aren't moral issues. They're called innocent infirmities. And Jesus was not, he didn't live in a palace. He, didn't, he wasn't a child of privilege. He experienced all of the same infirmities, innocent infirmities that any average child would go through. But despite it all, he was successful. The perfect character development of Jesus from infancy to manhood without sin is perhaps the most amazing fact of his entire life. This comes from the commentary, and it made me laugh. Um, <clears throat> how many of you have ever met a perfect kid? Yeah, I see a bunch of kids raise their hands. <laughs> Can you even imagine a perfect kid? And you know, when you're perfect, you get picked on. I know because I was perfect. <laughs> no, I mean, you know what I mean. Kids look for ways of, of pressuring, and if someone is keeping their integrity, you know, the one kid that won't tell a lie, they all try to, or the one kid that won't use a swear word, right? What do the other kids do? Let's try to trip them up. The one kid that's diligent and all that, Jesus, uh, the most amazing fact of his entire life 
was he was able to keep his integrity and his purity through his childhood. I, I think that that is a true statement. It staggers the imagination. And in view of the assurances that he enjoyed, no opportunities that God is willing to provide for our children, we may profitably inquire, how can these things be? Because Jesus was for us that we just cannot be for ourselves. Jesus was perfect. And although those resources are available to us because of the brokenness of sin, we fall into the trap and we need Jesus. We need a perfect Jesus even as a child. There is no excuse at any point in our life to give up on relying on Jesus. If he could be successful in his attitude, in his love, in his generosity, in his cheerfulness, even in childhood, there's hope that we can also learn from that. Jesus knows what it's like to grow up in a less than perfect family. He knows what it's like to have siblings. Jesus knows what it's like to be poor, dishonored, and misunderstood. Jesus experienced the joys and sorrows of a real childhood, and yet he is not ashamed to call us his brothers. Jesus overcame sin. His love for his brethren was never in doubt. And I want to end with this passage from Hebrews. He who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father. And for this reason, he is not ashamed to call us his brother. We are looked upon and loved by the Savior just like he would look at. Of course, he's all things considered. He's a son, he's a father, he's a Savior, a Redeemer. But he looks upon us also as a brother and a sister. And he is not ashamed to say, you're my brother, you're my sister. I love you. I came to save you, and I want you to be part of my family. That's the Jesus we worship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> I know we've just kind of, again, dipped into areas that the Bible gives us, just small windows, and yet there can be so many wonderful lessons that we can learn from this. Thank you, Father. You could have just showed up uh, like Elijah, just kind of showed up out of nowhere and proclaimed uh, the plan of God and done m amazing and miraculous things, but the fact that we have the knowledge that you came as a, 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 a regular human, you're born, you live, you, you had experiences, and in all of those things, you maintained your, your, your character, you maintained your integrity. It just teaches us so much about how much you love us. It helps us appreciate your ability to relate to us, that when we find ourselves in situations where we are uh, uh, lacking uh, respect or we are not uh, given uh, the, the uh, honor that we may feel is, is important to us. Lord, you know what that's like as well. And so, God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for being our brother. Thank you for coming as a child, living, growing, and embracing us at every turn. Help us to learn more about this every time we read about your life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I hope that you have a wonderful day. Potluck and Bible study coming up here. Um, and then the uh, concert tonight and the other parts of that. God bless you. We'll see you here soon.